Chapter 11, which is about a coffee party, the flight to the cave, and the arrival of the comet. The 7th of October was windless and very hot. Moomin Troll woke up and gave a huge yawn. Then he shut his mouth with a snap, and his eyes opened very wide. Do you realise what today is? he asked. The comet, whispered Sniff. My goodness, it was big. The red had turned to yellowish-white now, and round it was a circle of dancing flames. The wood seemed to be waiting, breathless. The ants were in their anthills, the birds in their nests, and every one of the little creeping things of the forest, who had not already left the place, had found somewhere to hide. "'What's the time?' asked Moomin Troll. Ten past twelve answered the snork. Nobody said another word. They clambered down the tree and set off as fast as they could towards home. Only the Hemulan went on making small, angry noises to himself about the stamps and the ruined dress in turns. "'Be quiet now,' said the snork. "'We have more important things to think about.' "'Do you think the comet will reach Moomin Valley before us?' whispered the Snork Maiden. "'Oh, we'll get there in time,' said Moomin Troll, but he looked worried. The swarm of grasshoppers had certainly not been this way, because the wood was green again, and the slope in front of them was white with flowers. "'Would you like a flower to put behind your ear?' asked Moomin Troll. "'Good gracious, no!' answered the Snork Maiden. "'I'm much too worried to think about things like that.' Meanwhile Sniff had gone ahead, and suddenly they heard him give a shout of excitement. "'Some new fuss, I suppose,' said the Hemulan. "'Hi! Hello! Hurry up!' shrieked Sniff. "'Run! Come on!' and he put his paws in his mouth and gave a piercing whistle. They set off at a run through the trees, Moomin Troll in front. As he ran, he sniffed, and a delicious smell of baking bread floated up to him. The trees thinned out, and Moomin Troll stopped suddenly with a shout of surprise and happiness. There below him lay the Valley of the Moomins, and in the middle, amongst the plum and poplar trees, stood a blue Moomin house, as blue and peaceful and wonderful as when he had left it, and inside his mother was peacefully baking bread and cakes. "'Now everything is going to be all right,' said Moomin Troll happily, and he was so overcome that he had to sit down. "'There's the bridge,' said the Snork Maiden. And there's the poplar tree you talked about that is so good to climb. What a beautiful house it is. Moomin Mamma was in the kitchen, decorating a big cake with pale yellow lemon peel and slices of crystallised pear. The words, To my darling Moomin Troll, were written round it in chocolate, and on the top there was a glittering star of spun sugar. Moomin Mamma was whistling softly to herself, and now and then she looked out of the window. Moomin Papa was wandering nervously from room to room, getting thoroughly in the way. "'They should be here soon,' he said. "'It's half-past one.' "'They'll be here all right,' said Moomin Mamma confidently. "'Wait a moment while I take away the cake. Sniff shall have the basin to lick out.' He always has it. If he comes, said Moomin Papa, and sighed deeply. At that moment the muskrat came and sat down in a corner. Well, what about the comet? asked Moomin Mamma. It's coming nearer, said the muskrat. This uh, is a time for weeping and wailing, sure enough. 
But of course that sort of thing doesn't affect a philosopher like me. Well, I hope you'll take good care of your whiskers when the time comes, said Moomin Mamma kindly. It would be a pity to get them singed. Will you have a ginger nut? Well, uh, thank you. Perhaps uh, a small one, said the muskrat. When he had eaten eight ginger nuts, he said, Young Moomintrail seems to be coming down the hill, accompanied by the strangest-looking party. I don't know if that interests you at all. Moomintrail, screamed Moomin Mamma. Why didn't you say so before? And she rushed out, closely followed by Moomin Papa. There they were, running across the bridge, first Moomin Troll and Sniff, then Snuffkin, then the Snorks, and last of all the Hemulan, who had not got over his bad temper. They all fell into each other's arms, and Moomin Mamma burst out, My darling Moomin child, I thought I should never see you again. Well, you should have seen me fight in with the poisonous bush, said Moomin Troll. Snip! Off came one arm, snap! Off came another, and in the end there was only a stump left. Well, said Moomin Mamma, and who is this little girl? Well, it's the Snork Maiden, said Moomin Troll, bringing her forward. She was the one I rescued from the poisonous bush. Uh, and this is Snuffkin, who is one of the world's wanderers. Uh, this is the Hemulan, the expert philatelist. Who? Oh, said Moomin Papa. Really? And then it dawned on him. Why, yes, he said. I remember collecting stamps in my youth. A very interesting hobby. "'It isn't my hobby. It's my work,' retorted the Hemulan rudely. He had slept badly. "'In that case,' said Moomin Papa, "'perhaps you could give me your opinion of a stamp album that was blown here yesterday evening by the tornado.' "'Stamp album, did you say?' exclaimed the Hemulan. "'It blew here?' "'Why, yes.' put in Moomin Mamma. I made the dough for the bread last night, and this morning it was full of little bits of sticky paper. <gasps> sticky paper! screeched the Hemulan. Those must be my rarest of rare specimens. Are they still here? Where are they? Surely in the name of all Hemulans you haven't thrown them away? They're all hanging up to dry said Moomin Mamma, pointing to a washing line under the plum trees. The Hemulan rushed off. Now there's some life in him, said Sniff, laughing. But he wouldn't run two steps if the comet were after him. Yes, the comet, said Moomin Mamma anxiously. The muskrat says it will fall in my kitchen garden this evening. It's most annoying because I've just weeded it. "'I suggest that we hold a meeting about it in Moomin House,' said the Snork. "'I mean, uh, if you don't mind, of course.' "'No, no, of course not,' said Moomin Papa. "'Come along in. Make yourselves at home.' "'There are some fresh ginger nuts,' said Moomin Mamma, slightly flurried, putting out the new coffee cups with roses and lilies on them. "'What a good thing you came along in time, dears.' "'Did you get the telegram that the house troll sent?' asked Sniff. "'Yes,' said Moomin Papa. "'But the letters were all topsy-turvy, and most of it was just exclamation marks. "'The house troll was obviously too nervous to send off any telegrams.' "'Just then Moomin Mamma leaned out of the window and cried, Coffee! And they all trooped inside, except the Hemulan. He was busy spreading out all his stamps and sorting them into different piles, and he only muttered crossly that he hadn't time. 
Well, said the Snork, now we can come to the point. Unfortunately, I have lost the exercise book where I had written down exactly what to do about escaping from comets. But one thing stands out as clear as the nose on my face, and that is that we must find a sheltered place to hide in. Oh, you make such a fuss about it all, said his sister. It's quite simple. All we have to do is to creep into Moomin Troll's cave and take our most precious belongings with us. And lots of food, said Sniff. And it's my cave, by the way. Good gracious me, exclaimed Moomin Mamma. Have you got a cave all of your own? This set Moomintroll and Sniff off on a long description of how they had found the cave, what a wonderful cave it was, and how it was an absolutely perfect hiding place. They both talked at the same time, each trying to speak louder than the other, and the result was that Sniff upset his coffee cup on the tablecloth. "'Really?' exclaimed Moomin Mamma in exasperation. "'It's obvious that you've all been living like hooligans while you've been away.' "'Sniff, you had better eat on the mat. "'And the cake basin is in the sink. "'You can take it with you if you like.' "'Sniff dived under the table cover with confusion, "'and the meeting continued. "'I've always believed in letting everybody do his bit,' "'said the Snork pompously. "'We must all carry our things up to the cave as soon as possible, "'because it's three o'clock already.' Perhaps my sister and I could carry the bedclothes. That will be fine, said Moomin Mamma. I'll take the jam. Sniff, dear, will you start emptying the drawers of the bureau, because all those things must be packed. So began the biggest running and carrying and packing you ever saw. Moomin Papa filled the wheelbarrow, and Moomin Mamma bustled about looking for string and newspaper. It was like being evacuated to the country in wartime, with only a few hours' notice. Over and over again, Moomin Papa pushed the wheelbarrow through the wood to the beach and unloaded it on the sand. Then Moomin Troll and Snuffkin hoisted everything up to the cave on a rope. Meanwhile, the others were collecting all that it was possible to move in the house, down to the door handles of the cupboards and the cords of the blinds. "'I don't intend to leave a single thing for that old comet,' muttered Moomin Mamma, pulling the bathtub through the door. "'Snork, dear, do run and pull the radishes in the kitchen garden, and Sniff, you can carry the cake up to the cave, but be very careful with it.' Moomin Papa came puffing up with the wheelbarrow. Oh, "'Hurry up, all of you,' he said. It will soon be getting dark, and the hole in the roof of the cave has still to be blocked up. Yes, yes, said Moomin Mamma. Coming directly, I just want the shells round my rhubarb bed, and the best of the roses. No, said Moomin Papa decidedly. We'll leave those behind anyway. Now get into the bath, my dear, and I'll wheel you up to the cave. Where is the hemulon? He's counting his stamps, said the snork maiden. Nothing else seems to interest him. Hullo, Hemel, shouted the snork. Hurry up, for goodness sake. The comet will be here in a minute, and then your stamps will most certainly be lost. Oh, heaven preserve me, exclaimed the Hemulan, and hopped straight into the bathtub, where he sat firmly with his stamp album, refusing to budge. Then the whole party set off on the last journey up to the cave. It was gloomy and desolate on the shore, with the great gap that had been the sea in front of them, the dark red sky overhead, and behind the forest panting in the heat. The comet was very near now. It glowed white-hot, and looked enormous as it rushed towards Moomin Valley. "'Where's the muskrat?' Moomin Mamma suddenly asked in a horrified voice. "'He wouldn't come,' answered Moomin Papa, 
He said it was unnecessary and undignified for a philosopher to rush about like this. I had to leave him, but I let him keep the hammock. Oh, well, sighed Moomin Mama. It's difficult to understand philosophers. Out of the way now, children. Papa is going to hoist up the bath. Moomin Troll, Sniff and Snuffkin heaved and shouted up in the cave, while Moomin Papa and the Snorks pushed and gave orders from the sand, and the bath wobbled up and down, slipped and was heaved again, until at last it was on the ledge outside the cave. Moomin Mamma had been sitting on the sand all this time, mopping her forehead, and now she gave a great sigh and exclaimed, Ah, what a move! The Hemulan, of course, had taken no part in the removal of the bath, apart from sitting in it. He had already crept into the cave and was arranging his stamps. Always some fuss and hurry, he muttered. If only I could make out what's come over them all. And while it got hotter and hotter and darker and darker, the hands of the clock slowly crept nearer to seven. They couldn't get the bath through the opening of the cave and the snork wanted to hold a meeting about it. But as there wasn't time for that, they decided to hoist it right up to the roof to stop up the opening there. Moomin Mama made beds for them all on the soft sandy floor of the cave and lit the lamp while Snuffkin hung a blanket up in front of the door. Do you think that will be enough protection? asked Moomin Troll. Snuffkin pulled a bottle out of his pocket and waved it triumphantly. "'Have you forgotten the underground sun-oil I got from the fire spirit?' he asked. "'The last drop is just enough to paint the outside of the blanket, "'and then twenty comets won't be able to burn it up.' "'It won't stain the blanket, I hope?' asked Moomin Mamma anxiously. "'Just then they heard a sniffing and rustling outside the cave, "'and a nose poked under the blanket.' Then came two black eyes, and then a whole muskrat. "'Oh!' exclaimed Sniff. "'You came after all, Uncle Muskrat!' "'Yes. I found it difficult to think down there in the heat,' said the muskrat, lumbering off to a corner with great dignity. "'Now we're ready,' said Moomin Papa. "'What's the time?' Twenty-five past seven, said the snork. Then we've got time to taste the cake, said Moomin Mamma. Sniff, where did you put it? Somewhere over there, said Sniff, pointing to the corner where the muskrat was sitting. Where? asked Moomin Mamma. I can't see it. Muskrat, have you seen a cake anywhere? "'I don't bother myself over things like cakes,' said the muskrat, twisting his moustache solemnly. "'I don't see them, taste them, or feel them in any way, ever.' "'Yes, but where in the world has that cake got to?' said Moomin Mamma in despair. "'Sniff, you can't have eaten it all on the way.' "'It was too big.' said Sniff innocently. "'So you ate some of it?' screamed Moomin Troll. "'Come on, own up!' Uh, "'Only the star on the top,' said Sniff. "'And that was rather hard.' He crawled under the mattress and hid himself. "'Ah, miserable children,' said Moomin Mamma, sitting down on a chair and suddenly feeling rather tired. The Snork Maiden looked sharply at the Muskrat. "'Would you mind moving a moment, Uncle Muskrat?' she asked. "'Here I sit and here I stay,' said the Muskrat. "'There you sit on our cake,' said the Snork Maiden. Then the Muskrat got up, and, oh dear, you never saw such a mess as there was on his bottom. And as for the cake... "'That was unnecessary, anyhow,' piped Sniff. "'My cake, too,' groaned Moomin Troll. "'In my honour. Uh, "'Now I shall be sticky for the rest of my life, I suppose,' 
said the muskrat bitterly. I only hope I can bear it like a man and a philosopher. Be quiet, all of you, cried Moomin Mama. It's still the same cake, just a different shape, that's all. Now bring up your plates and we'll share it out all the same. And she cut the squashed cake into nine equal pieces and doled it out. Then she filled a basin with warm water and told the muskrat to sit down in it. <sighs> this has completely disturbed my peace, he complained. A philosopher should be protected against the rude happenings of everyday life. Never mind, said Moomin Mama consolingly. You'll soon feel better. But I do mind, said the muskrat peevishly. Never any peace, and he mumbled on. It grew hotter and hotter in the cave. They all sat in separate corners and waited. Now and again there was a sigh, or somebody passed an obvious remark. Otherwise there was silence. Suddenly Moomin Troll jumped up. We've forgotten the soap, monkey, he cried. So we have, said Moomin Mama. What a dreadful thing! I saw her only yesterday chasing crabs. She must be rescued, said Moomin Troll decidedly. Does anybody know where she lives? She doesn't live anywhere, said Moomin Papa. I'm afraid she must be left to her fate. We haven't got time to look for her. Oh, please don't go, dear Moomin Troll, entreated the Snork Maiden. I must, he answered. I'll be back, and don't worry. Take my watch so that you can keep an eye on the time, said the Snork, and be as quick as you can. It's a quarter past eight already. Then I've got twenty-seven minutes, said Moomin Troll. He hugged his anxious mamma, swallowed the last bit of cake, and dived under the blanket. It was like walking into an enormous oven with the heat full on. The trees hung limp and motionless, while the comet burnt so brightly that you couldn't look at it. Moomin Troll ran across the sand and into the wood, shouting at the top of his voice, Ahoy! Silk Monkey! Where are you? Silk Monkey! In the red gloom under the trees, not a breath of life stirred. All the small creatures had hidden themselves underground and were cowering there, silent and afraid. Only Moomin Troll ran through the wood. He stopped and called, then listened and ran on again. At last he stood still and looked at the watch. He only had twelve minutes left. He would have to go back. He gave one last yell, and this time, to his joy, a faint sound came back in reply. He put his paws to his mouth and called again, and the answer came nearer. A moment later, the silk monkey swung down from a tree in front of him. Well, well, she chattered. Fancy meeting you. I was just wondering. We haven't time to talk now, interrupted Moomin Troll. Just follow me to the cave as quickly as you can, otherwise something terrible will happen to us. They set off as fast as they could, the silk monkey laughing and screaming and asking questions without the faintest notion of what was happening. Is it something exciting? she babbled, throwing herself from branch to branch in great glee. She thought it was all very amusing, some kind of race, perhaps. Moomin Troll had never run so fast in his life. Now and then he looked at the watch, and that seemed to be going faster than usual as well. Only four minutes left. They came out on the beach. Three minutes. Oh, how difficult it was to run on the sand. Moomin Troll clutched the silk monkey's paw, and together they made a last headlong dash. Moomin Mama was waiting outside the cave, and when she caught sight of them, she started waving her arms and shouting, Quickly, children, run, run! They scrambled wildly up the rock, and Moomin Mama caught hold of them and pushed them through the opening in front of her. Oh, thank goodness, gasped the snork maiden, 
and she slowly began to get her normal colour back, because she had been pink with worry for the last twenty minutes. You got back in time, my own moment, troll. Then they all heard a dreadful sound outside, a great hissing roar. All of them, except the Hemulan, who was occupied with his stamps, and the muskrat, who was stuck in the basin of hot water, threw themselves flat on the floor in a heap. The lamp went out, and they were in complete darkness. The comet was diving headlong to earth. It was exactly forty-two minutes and four seconds past eight. There was a rush of air as if a million rockets were being let off at once, and the earth shook. The Hemulan fell on his face among the stamps. Sniff yelled at the top of his voice, and Snufkin pulled his hat even farther down over his nose for protection. The comet roared with its flaming tail right through the valley, across the forest and the mountains, and then disappeared again over the edge of the world. If it had come a tiny bit nearer to the earth, I am quite sure that none of us would be here now, but it just gave a whisk of its tail and swept off to another solar system far away, and it has never been seen since. But in the cave they didn't know all this, they thought everything had been burnt up or smashed to atoms when the comet came down, and that their cave was the only thing left in the whole world. They listened and listened, but all they heard was silence. Mama, said Moomin Troll, is it over now? Yes, it's over, my little Moomin child, said his mother. Now everything is all right, and you must go to sleep. You must all go to sleep, my dears. Don't cry, Sniff. There's no danger now. The Snork Maiden was trembling. Wasn't it dreadful? she said. Don't think about it any more, said Moomin Mamma. Cuddle up to me, little silk monkey, and keep warm. I'm going to sing you all a lullaby. And this is what she sang. Snuggle up close and shut your eyes tight And sleep without dreaming the whole of the night The comet is gone and your mother is near To keep you from harm till the morning is here And presently they dropped off to sleep, one by one Until at last it was quite quiet and peaceful in the cave 